some good guys. I'll just finish reading your posts. I think they're going to give us lots of avenues into talking about this movie. Um, reminder that our movie for Thursday is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And that's our movie for, for Thursday. Again, uh, if you have streaming, uh, it's on HBO, I know. I don't know. It was on Netflix for a while. I don't know if they took it off or not because Netflix just made a show about one of the characters in the movie. So um, you can check there too, but I do know it's there. And then after that, we'll only have one more movie in our drama unit. That'll be Apocalypse Now next week. And then after that, we shall move on to our next genre. I think a second genre is Westerns. I might be wrong. I'd have to relook at the syllabus. It might be Noirs. I don't know which one I put first. So, uh, excellent. Um, so today then, Casablanca, directed by Michael, Michael Curtis. Michael Curtis is our director this time. He's oftentimes called one of the most underrated directors ever, right? Just because he's not, he has a very strong filmography, but um, lots of times when people talk about the script, Casablanca, they say, well, it had a strong script, right? How much, how much work did the director really have to do? Right? But lots of, there's lots of interesting stuff here that, uh, that he does, that he does do well. So how do we, how do we even start with this movie? Um, so it was made in the early 40s, right? The early 40s. It comes from the, a, a play called, um, I think it's like A Night at Rick's. I think that's what the play is called. Um, but, you know, this movie came out before the U.S. became involved in World War II, which at, it's, it's a surreal type of feeling in the movie, knowing that, right? Just because we have the specter of the Germans, right? That are kind of looming large, even though we weren't yet involved in the war. So, uh, you know, they are, they are our antagonists here. So extremely interesting film. Uh, the mise-en-scene of Casablanca is as this sort of crazy place is, is part of, of the plot, right? So many people go here, they're seeking you know, safe passage to America. Um, and this is this movie's a movie of great characters. You know, we have Rick, and you know, we have Ilsa, um, and everyone else, the the, the police chief, and you know, the other refugees who come there. The love story. So much, so much to talk about here with this with this movie. Where to where to even begin? So, uh, as as I did last time, I'm going to. Hold on one moment. I'm going to plug my computer up. I don't want to die. My computer to die in the middle of class would be bad. It? All right. So um, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you guys. Um, what did you think of this movie? Was this your first time watching it? Um, some of you commented on the discussion forums about lines in the movie that you've heard that have become almost part of a vernacular today. All right. It's expressions that we use. So, um, yeah, general impressions of the movie. What did you think watching Casablanca? Some of you the first time, maybe some of you have seen it before. What, what this was, was my first time of watching uh, Casablanca, though I'd heard about it all my life. I love Humphrey Bogart and, and his movies, um, but um, I didn't really uh, know what Casablanca was. Um, I didn't know if it was a person, a town. So when I entered into this, totally uh, unaware that um, uh, Casablanca was a place in Africa and what it entailed, I thought that was a major part of this film. So with pleasant surprise, quickly I understood at least what the, the, the title was. And uh, the movie totally intrigued me from uh, all aspects of it, from lighting to camera work to the actors who they were, they were phenomenal. But so was, so was the, you know, the script. And uh, so 
Um, I really, really enjoyed the movie. Um, and I also loved the, uh, how it came across to the audience, especially knowing that war loomed in the, in the minds of people. And, uh, it was always pressing. The Nazis were always pressing upon, uh, I thought, the script. Right. That there, it's like a loom inspector, but they're always there, right? And they're, yeah, very good. Yeah, I was, I was with you um, when I first watched it a couple of years ago. I was like, yeah, I didn't know what the title meant or any of that. So it, it quickly... The movie does a really good job early on in setting up the plot, right? Giving you the setting, establishing the mood and the atmosphere, right? It does that masterfully within like three minutes at the beginning of the yes. movie. And two, there, there didn't seem to be a lot of different scenery, scenes, different scenes. I mean, there were a lot of different scenes. That's not the way to put it. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of, it's not like you're going from that town to this town. We're in Rick's or we're there in Casablanca. We're not in a lot of other places. It reminded me to a, to a, a little degree of 12 angry men where they're in the one courtroom and uh, the whole entire movie practically. So, but the scenes that they got, that they made the interesting in that, in Rick's place was, I prop I thought pretty astounding. I thought it was great. Yeah, that's that's a very good observation, right? There's not many we have the idea of mise en scene, right? There isn't a lot of mise en scene, right? We got Rick's, we got like the black market guy's place, we have the police station, and we have the airport. That's about it. Right? It's, and uh, we also have the um, the bit Paris. We have Paris briefly when that goes to the flashback. And the bedroom, the bedroom of uh, what was it? It's Ilsa, Rick's, it's a real, Rick's Ilsa bedroom, her, or Ilsa and her husband's bedroom. We we see that too. I think that's it, right? That's kind of crazy that we had a two-hour movie, and that's all the places we see. Yeah, we we get to I, see the the light tower that is um, kind of. I, I I read one commentary about it was said it was kind of almost fake looking and yet it 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 added to the movie that uh lighthouse scene where the light is it looked like there was somebody up there with a big light just shining it but but it did add to the movie so yeah yeah I, that stood out to me a lot as well and i believe that that was really kind of used as a device to give this feeling of isolation that i'm sure you know, those people would have felt being stuck in Casablanca and not being able to leave. I think it was used very well. Right. Yeah, this, the geographical nature of Casablanca, right? There's nowhere you can even escape to once, once you're there, right? You can't, you can't go east because of uh, Nazi occupied territory, right? You can't go west because the ocean's there. So, it's very um, confining, almost suffocating of an atmosphere that we get. Other general thoughts and impressions of the movie before we- I really enjoyed this movie. I had never watched it before. Um, I probably, well, definitely the my most favorite movie so far that we've watched. Um, I liked the storyline, it kept your attention. I loved the score, the musical score. Um, and I realized so much, like <laughs> I couldn't believe how many lines and the music and things like that, that I've heard all my life, which has been a long time. I've heard all my life and didn't realize where it came from. I didn't realize its origin. So I, I liked that a lot, um, just, to, those iconic actors anyway and um i think humphrey bogart's voice is just amazing he could read the phone book to me and i could just probably go to sleep <laughs> but um you know and just the storyline you know how they had this amazing sweep you off your feet type love affair 
and you know she found out at the end you know of their affair that her husband was alive and she felt that that was her place would be beside him because he needed her and putting herself on the back burner you know for him just like Humphrey Bogart done for her in the end of putting himself in the back burner for her so and just how it their love affair kind of affected them both you know when she heard that song she would tear up and you know he was real calloused and didn't want relationships with people he didn't want to have a drink with people he didn't have any women around him and it just I liked that aspect of it and then you had the war aspect also you know where they were just trying to do what they could to take over like the one scene um, in Rick's where they're singing the German song right after they sang you know, something in American, and that, then, you they know, were singing, they were, they were singing, back. Yeah, they were singing the French Revolution, the French Liberation songs. Okay. It was almost just like slap in the face to the Germans. Yeah. That's easily my favorite scene in the entire movie. I watched that, and I was like, oh, man, that's, like, powerful. Was, I love yeah. it. It was, like, very much like, you don't own us. Like, you must, you occupy this land, but you don't own us. You don't own our spirit. Yeah, exactly. I felt the same way. It was very moving, very touching. But I, I was um, really impressed with it. And um, I thought that the lighting and the, the scenery and all that was very, everything came for full circle um, as far as the movie and the plot and, you know, like the music, the writing, directing, everything went together perfectly, I thought. I was more impressed with this film in all aspects than I have been in the others. I definitely see why it won so many awards. Interestingly enough, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you more in a second about the lines you said you heard, Crystal. I was going to say, interestingly enough, I was looking at the Academy Awards. Casablanca really didn't win much that year. The, 19, the three movies we've watched so far all came out in 1940 and 41. All right. So all of these movies were up against each other during the Academy Awards that year. So uh, crazy to think about. All three of these have become classics. But uh, Grape, R Grapes of Wrath won most of the Oscars. Um, Casablanca really, really didn't win much. So inter interesting. It said in, um, in 1944 that it won uh, Best Director, Best Screenplay, and um, Best Motion Picture right. with, with the Academy is what I found. Right. And I'm surprised because Casablanca is the only movie that I like out of the three we've watched, Casablanca is the only movie that I even knew about before like a few years ago. Like I knew Citizen Kane because of its uh uh prestige. I've heard people say it's the greatest movie ever made. But I never heard of The Grapes of Wrath, I never heard of Citizen Kane, but I definitely heard of Casablanca. And I know about the famous scene on the uh, at the airport and all that. So it's it's surprising that it hasn't re it didn't really win that much. Yeah, you might. You, I think you might actually be right here, Crystal. Uh, I think you are. I thought it came out around that same time as Kane and Grapes of Wrath, but maybe it did come out a few years later. Um, forty four instead of forty one, forty two. So. I will stand corrected here. You're, you're right on that. Um, tell me about, Crystal, you tell me about the lines that you've heard in the, in the movie. Well, I mean, all my life I've heard, um, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, what were the other two that I'd heard? Here's uh, looking at you. Yeah, here's looking at you, kid. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, oh, of all the gin joints in gin all the world, joints. she walks into mine. You know, I've heard those all my life, just like the song. You know, I've heard it all my life, just didn't know where it came from. So it, it gives you a little bit more insight to it. I mean, I'm one of those people who run around and quote movies constantly. I will annoy you to death <laughs> quoting movies and you, you, you just have to know what movie I'm talking about or I sound like a complete moron. But, um, you know, something like that does jump out to me because that is something that I use in my everyday language plus I've heard it 
literally all my life whenever I was a child and growing up so I mean I I like figuring out where it came from because I didn't know if it was just old wives tales or old sayings that you know older people said I had no clue that it came from this movie that's been a kind of a uh, family tradition with us uh, from the time Crystal was little, uh, smaller, we, I had, to, you know, we had picked this, this thing up of, of quoting movies. Uh, today, we love Old Brother, Where Art Thou, and The Elf, and all those movies now, uh, but for years, I, I was able to take credit for a lot of those things, but now I can't, because she's watching these movies, but um, Crystal's mother's real quiet and she doesn't say a lot, but now we've got her to the point where she's starting to quote movies also. So it's a part of our heritage to enjoy uh, quoting um, a, a movie um, at a certain time in conversation. Like our biggest one right now is um, uh, uh, about uh, in Old Brother, Where Art Thou? Where uh, the Bible salesman takes a big branch and hits one of the guys. And he said, uh, I don't get it, Big Dan. So when there's something that's confusing in our family, we'll simply say, well, I don't get it, Big Dan. <laughs> and um, these quotes in this movie, though, think about how long that they have lasted. I mean, goodness gracious, that shows um, some award-winning uh, actors, actresses, and uh, movie production for us to still today quote those movies. 80 years. Wow. And uh, I didn't recognize as many as you did, Crystal, but one that stood out to me was We'll Always Have Paris. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just I heard that and I was like, where have I heard that before? I don't even know where and all I've heard it before, but it was very familiar to me. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so several quotes become a part of our vernacular today, right? Like you guys said, it's interesting to trace it back to, to this. This is definitely the most quotable of all the movies we've, we've watched so far, for sure. One thing I thought about this movie, I think, especially with the main characters, with Richard and with uh, Ilsa, I think they did really good character building. Because honestly, for before we found out or before the movie really disclosed the Ilsa's husband, she thought her husband was dead when it appeared that, you know, she had just ran off on her husband. I did not like her for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was like, you're going to run off on your husband with this other man. Then you're going to try to ask for help for you and your husband. And then you're going to try and leave your husband for that other man. And I was very conflicted. And then once we found out, I was like, yeah. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I was I, like, I had a really negative view of her up until it explained, but I still couldn't figure out that when they had, you know, had the reunion in Casablanca, if she actually has still had feelings for Rick or not. I couldn't, I could like, feelings are like if she still loved him. I wouldn't say feelings, but like if she still was in love with him, even though it, because it was kind of wishy-washy on it. And I, I still can't decide on if I feel like she did or didn't. I agree with that. The ending of it really got me because you know, she did not make the decision to go with her husband. She was on board to go with Richard and to leave her husband. So I really, you know, I don't know how to feel about her still yet. And she was um, kind of back and forth with all of that too, because I kind of felt like when she came to him and was asking for those passes that she was just playing him. And I felt like that she had played him before and just used him as a you know, a little whirlwind romance and then just didn't go with him whenever it was time to go and then maybe got married after the fact. I didn't realize until after they explained it a little further, um, you know, that he had been in a concentration camp and had been injured and she felt like that he needed her. And I did feel like that she was totally playing him though in the, the scene in his room or his office when she came there to ask for those, I felt like she was just trying to tell him what he wanted to hear just to be able to get those because it was going to be hard for her to get out of there. And then I also thought that maybe she didn't go because she felt like it was going to be difficult for, for her to go from place to place for whatever reason. Um, 
you know, maybe passport type reasons or whatever. I don't know. But um, I was conflicted with her for a while, too. I agree. I agree with that so much. Another thing that really caught my attention, you know, me and myself thinking from that perspective, if I thought that my fiance had died, I don't think that within a year, like any time less than like two years, I could have, in, I could enter a romantic relationship with someone else. And then you look at Richard and after he left her, you can see a very long lasting effect, you know, he mm. still isn't comfortable forming relationships. He's still holding on to some of that sentiment. And really to me, it, oh, I don't even know. <laughs> well, that's one of the things, that's one of the things that this movie uh, did to us as we watched it from listening to you all. It places us in the middle and it's a decision-making factor. I, I didn't know if my paper made any sense at all, but what I was trying to say in my paper was that there's there's a theme, an underlining theme in this movie of being in between something, having to make a decision. Yes, no, right, left, whatever. Um, and then what happened to us in the movie as we watched it, it was putting us in between. Do we like this character? Do we not like this character? And so I, I thought it was a, I thought it, it not only was a film to watch, to enjoy, it was a movie or a film, a flick that would engage our thinking, our creative thinking. And so I, I thought that was part of their plan was to, you know, not give out all that information about her early on. So we developed a, an opinion of her that changed as the movie went on. And then at the end of it, we weren't so sure even though she was certainly glamorous and beautiful, she still had that, that look of a very, uh, very, uh, an amazing woman. But we, we still, even after we've watched it, we still have questions about her. I had questions about Sam too, um, the piano player, because whenever he was, she asked for that song and then he had even stated, you know, like, oh, I don't remember it. I don't, like he was very friendly to her but yet callous and then um whenever he told rick that you know she's not good for you she doesn't bring you good luck i i guess that was a way of kind of throwing her under the bus a little bit to make us kind of go back and forth on her but i was kind of like that on him i thought well if this guy loves this woman and she's this emotional by just being around him and and hearing of this memory then what's his problem? <laughs> but I mean, I see now that he was just trying to protect his friend because he's seen what an effect that, that that woman did make on him. Yeah, at first it seems like she's mocking him almost, right? Going in and making him play that song. Yeah. He has a shocked look on his face when he hears it and he sees her. I mean, it's, it almost seems cruel at first that she's making him listen to it again. Yeah, how he said he came up and was like, I told you not to play that song. And then he looked up and seen that she was there. So, I mean, you can tell that there was a lot of heartache there on his part. Uh, Sam seemed very loyal to Rick. I mean, uh, remember he was going to, the, the one uh, owner of another club was going to pay him a lot more money or, but he was very loyal to Rick and, you wonder, and the movie doesn't explain that to us, Rick must have been good to him in the past for him to be that loyal in the present and the future. He must have. Go ahead, Cord. You got stuck. Long enough to, uh, did y'all hear me? No. Of course. I just said my entire point while the internet was going out. <laughs> but, uh, I said, uh, I lost my point. <laughs> well, it's about, I mean, I had made a comment about Sam being so loyal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you could tell he was, he was loyal at least for a long enough time to know what happened between him and Ilsa and to know mm -hmm. Ilsa and to know why not to play that song and all that. So 
you know he's been with him for a while. Yeah, and she was familiar with him as well. And the, what was I going to say? <laughs> You're rubbing off on me. Um, uh, whenever he was, when Rick was signing the club over and he said, you know, he gets 25%. And the guy said, well, I happen to know that he gets like 10 or 15. I forget which it was, but okay. Like he was making sure that he took care of him as well because he wasn't going to be there to make sure that that happened. He wanted to make sure and ensure that someone else done that because if he didn't do it, then the, the club wasn't going to be signed over to him. You know something I just realized? Well, I realized that as you guys were speaking about it, um, because we didn't know that Rick wasn't going to get on the plane until the end scene. So all this time in preparation that he's making for him to supposedly go to America with the woman, I, can't, I have a hard time saying her name, but with her, um, he was really preparing to, you know, probably either be in a concentration camp or his own death because he had that planned all along. I think that follows along with Bill's point about how this whole movie was kind of about choices. That was like a really central theme to it. You know, we don't know what was going on in Richard's mind. We don't know if that whole time he was trying to make up his mind, whether he was going to go with uh, Ilsa or if her husband was going to go. And we finally get to that last moment and we see that he has that selflessness to honestly kind of free her from that bond and free himself from it as well I saw it as a very freeing moment in general because um this emotional trauma sort of that had been holding him back that had been affecting him you know he wouldn't drink with any of his customers he wouldn't discuss politics you know he said oh he didn't plan that far ahead I felt like that really kind of released him to change his ways and to get a little bit more happiness out of his life you can almost make the uh, connection that him letting the plane go and him letting both of them leave to America is him letting go that trauma. It's him just saying, I'm, I'm releasing it. It's out of my hands. Yeah, because we thought that he was going to set her husband up the entire time. We thought that with his plan that he came to him with, like he had really thought about this, came to him with a plan and and executed that plan. We really thought that he was just going to get him set up to just do away with him so he could have his woman and it be over. But instead he loved her enough to let her go, <clears throat> even the second time and as, as hard as the first time was. But that shows another um, aspect of like how much he actually did love her. This is a good time to talk about Humphrey Bogart's performance as Rick. Um, I was I was talking I was when I was rewatching this movie I was talking to who I was watching it with I said could any actor have played this part better than Bogart did like if they tried to remake this movie who who could do it I don't know I, I can't think of anyone like he has so much of this character's depth like this is a good time to even talk about like masculinity and uh in cinema right this is a good time to talk about that because we're going to talk about that when we get the westerns too um but he portrays this he, he does similar performances in a lot of his films we're going to watch another film of his that he's in called the big sleep but um he has this almost like laconic reserve about him like he, he's this man of great emotional depth Right, but he doesn't show it at all. Right, he's he's that you don't talk about your feelings. Right, kind of kind of old school, kind of old school masculinity. Right, so, he's very manly, like a manly man, and very calloused. I mean, you you kind of think of him as almost rude and um, out of the way, but he's really not. He's just all about business and just getting through his day is kind of how he he portrayed to me i thought at first that he was um just some old hateful man but he really wasn't he was just someone who was very heartbroken but he was very um mainly a man's man because even the enemies respected him and liked him 
Well, yeah. throughout the years, uh, people have watched movies uh, because Humphrey Bogart was the star. And from all of these quotes, well, most generally, who's doing the quoting? Who's saying those quotes that we have repeated year after year after year? It's Humphrey Bogart. There is a difference, I think, between great baseball players and baseball players that are in the Hall of Fame, although that's changing now. Used to be when somebody was in the Hall of Fame, they were the elite in it. Humphrey Bogart is an elite actor of all time. And I think he shows that. And he, his presence demands an audience. He is manly, like you said. He is, you don't know what he's thinking. It's like a, a, a lady saying to a man, what is it that you're thinking? I never know what you're thinking. Uh, well, he never knew what he was thinking really, because men generally, especially in that era, uh, held everything in. And they did make decisions. They were the, they were the head of things, if you will. Um, so he, 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 he was a commanding actor. He's, I think, I don't know who my favorite actor is, but uh, I'd certainly have to put him in the top five when trying to figure that out. I agree. And sorry, you want to go first, Corey? Or I was going to go ahead real quick. I was going to say the interesting thing about him was physically he wasn't that imposing of a guy. He was like five five, like really, like really skinny, lanky guy, right? But it goes to show you a little bit of how personality and maybe good camera work, right? Maybe goes a long way, right? And showing and showing uh, such an empowering presence that he has here. You go ahead now, Nicole. Uh, on that point, you know, as far as height goes, did anyone else notice with uh, Ilsa's husband, every time the, the officials would come over when they first entered the bar, he would stand up and be towering over them. I thought that was really interesting. And I only, that was honestly one of the only points where I really noticed the stature of an actor in this movie. Hmm. I noticed that too. I think that had a lot to do with uh, his role as like speaking out against the Nazis because he, you know, standing up to them. That's how I felt like that's what that represented. I agree. You want to go ahead, at Reagan, and since Reagan and uh, Kirsten wrote about this, so both of you can chime in if you want to go by. Yeah, but both of you guys wrote about, kind of wrote about how it was almost a propaganda movie of sorts. You want to elaborate more on that? Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was uh, like plain propaganda because, I mean, it had characters from each side, like the Nazi, the Nazi major, and then it had Captain Louis, or Louis or however, and then it had the America, American, which was Rick, and he was neutral just like America started out in the World War II. Like it, I think it like how I wrote, uh, how I wrote about it. Like I really think it was just plain in your face to see, you know. I agree with that. I think that after our discussion about the choices that, you know, is a thread throughout this whole movie, I think that this movie really imposed a choice. You know, it was pre-America's entry into World War II. I think that it was just kind of a slap in the face like you know we see all these people making choices the watcher is uh pushed to make choices and i think that that can be played even more into america's you know push to make a choice oh yeah bill made a really good point about that too about how the movie's all about choices i thought the same thing nicole that it was all about like it all led up to the big choice of america joining into the war You can tell, uh, I think Rick tells, or Rick asks Sam when it is, and he says December 1941, and he says something like, uh, uh, everybody in America is sleeping in their homes tonight. December 7th was Pearl Harbor. So you can tell that that was a big part of the entire movie and the beginning of America getting involved into it. And I'll even speak and say, because I'm the history 
I'm going to be a future history teacher. As far as I know of, I could have this wrong, but I'm thinking we didn't know exactly how bad concentration camps were until after World War II was over, until 1945. This was made in 1942, so it was all, as far as we know, a concentration camp, whatever we knew about it, it was just a jail. We didn't know uh, where you go to starve and possibly get murdered. You're exactly right about that. We didn't know until we rolled into them and saw how horrible they were, right? Auschwitz and all the different places. Right? Um, the Several years ago, when I was in a speech class at Southern, that's been about 20 years ago, um, the first lesson I learned was know your audience, know who you're speaking to, know what their interests are that you may obtain their favor. Um, and as I look at this, who's gonna watch this movie generally? It's gonna be people from the victory side. It's gonna be Americans and people of English descent, whatever. And Victor Lazo, is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, Lazlo. Uh, just his name, Victor, certainly is a close word to victory. and his stature in this would, of course, we want Victor because of the cause to be much more dominant than the Nazis or the, uh, the people that was our enemy. So I think there's another underlining reason that Victor had this presence as uh, Reagan and Nicole were talking about. He did, I thought he had a tremendous presence. And of all the people that were in this conflict of being in the middle and having to make a decision, Victor did not have to. He was a man with a cause and he was set and he was, I thought he was formidable. He was great. And so uh, that's just, um, that's just a great point that they brought out about how he, uh, he, he had this disappearance that was, was really uh, masculine. You know, Corey, I was going to um, kind of see your standpoint on this because I'm not very proficient in history. <laughs> it's probably my least favorite subject. But um, as you get older, you realize that knowing your history helps um, pave the way to your present and your future. So um, I was going to see your standpoint and I was interested to see what you was going to have to say about this and about how it actually went in with the history that was actually going on at the time that this movie came out. I had a lot of questions myself because while I know general things that happened in World War II, I don't know the exact time. Like I know 1939 is when Hitler invaded Poland. And I know 1945-ish is around the time when it ended. 1941 is when we got into it. That's about all I knew. And I didn't know any specifics about like when they said uh, Casablanca is in French uh, Morocco, I knew Germany took over France. And I was like, I wonder how that's gonna happen. Like, I was legitimately asking like, how does that work when you have uh, French occupying the territory in, uh, in Africa, and then you have the Germans taking over Spain or taking over France, what happens then? And I got the answer to that. <laughs> The, the, German, the Germans had a whole campaign in, in Africa around this time, too. So, like, they, you know, their presence was definitely in, in Africa. And that's where, that's where the famous General Rommel, that's his name, the Desert Fox, right? Because he was a tank, uh, he was a panzer commander uh, there. But Corey is exactly right. They did not know how bad the camps were. So, like, when they make mention of it in the movie, like they did not know so that that even kind of history adds to the movie in that way right because when they did it they didn't know how bad it was if they did know i'm sure they would have went into a lot more detail about the trauma of how bad it was right. but we just didn't know this brings up a question that i had throughout the movie you know it's alluded that richard was on the run from the nazis for some reason and I don't, know, I don't know if maybe I missed it, but I don't think it ever goes into detail about why 
and what the reason is. Of course, we understand the reason with um, Ilsa's husband, but we never know with Richard. Hurston, I saw you unmuted your mic. You want to say something? You can always type in the chat too if your mic doesn't work. I was just saying that if you look at if you look at like the first Captain America, you're looking at uh he it, the first one, uh, the cover art is actually him punching Hitler. If you look at other shows and movies from that time period, um, and I only know this really because I'm really into theater, uh, you're looking at a lot of it is propaganda. Um, even Three Stooges were going off and had something to do with Nazis and Americans being the Nazis. Uh, so you're looking at there was a little bit of propaganda with that. Um, and I think it was more with Richard. Uh, he wasn't running away from the Nazis because he allowed them in to his, uh, I think it was uh, Rick's uh, Cafe Americano or Americana. Um, he let them into the business, let them actually kill a guy um but he was running away from the americans um because he apparently did something in america and was on the run from whatever crime uh i think it was hinted at he killed a guy or it was like some sort of romance or something there was something to that so yeah rick rick talks about how he was this freedom fighter type like before before the Germans and started their stuff, there was a Spanish Civil War where fascists took over Spain, and Rick kind of joined the um, the, the army against the fascists. So he's he's showing all throughout the movie that he has this anti-fascist sentiment, right? Just for just for the fact he got himself involved in the Spanish Civil War, which took place in the 30s. So I know some extra historical context for some of you who might not have known about that. Um, on the note of masculinity, um, I also you go on, Kirsten. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say I also looked it up. Um, it had eight nominees and three wins, which actually was one short from the major winner that night. Um, so that was actually a lot during that time period for an Academy Award. Which ones was it? Was it best I just picture? thought if anybody wanted to know that. Was it best picture? Like uh, uh best, best picture. Um right. it actually beat out the major winner for that night um for best picture and then it got um a couple of others like two others um best picture writing and directing. Right. But um, talking about just the name of his cafe, uh, Rick's Amer uh, Cafe Americaine, American, uh, American is is uh, in the French, in the French. Uh, I can't think of the word for it. French uh, spelling of it, and it's the masculine spelling, which of course is because you know it's Rick's. American Cafe, but I just thought that was interesting. And it's in the uh, masculine spelling in the um, French word. That is interesting. I hadn't thought of that. When those days you, um, women had their place and it wasn't where women are today. <laughs> they weren't, if they were working, it was in a saloon or something of, of that nature you know it, and they were to run the household and um it wasn't any type of or very much 
like business owners and things like that. And, and you had men that wouldn't have went in if it had been, you know, a woman owned establishment. It was because Rick owned it and maybe because he stayed a little out of the politics it was probably very smart business-wise on his part as well. A good example of what you uh, were speaking about too is uh, in the movie where she was like, I just can't think anymore. I'm gonna let you think for the both of us. I feel like that was really, you know, about masculinity and stuff. I feel like that really played a role in it to show, you know, show us that it was all about the men. <laughs> Yeah, this, this movie definitely uh, demounts what you're saying, Reagan. It definitely follows that old saying of behind every great man is a great woman, right? Just because it's insinuated that Laszlo wouldn't be able to be the freedom fighter he was if he didn't have his, his great love behind him, right? So he could, he could have ideally took one of the tickets and went off himself and Rick and Ilsa could have just hung around Casablanca. Uh, it's insinuated he wouldn't be able to do his great work without her as his sort of muse, right? Which which is a which is a old stereotype about women, right? But it's 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 in some ways true too, right? Because some men are very dependent on on their partner as far as anchoring them, so to speak. If you remember, we also seen an example of that in the Grapes of Wrath, talking about the mall character at the end where he was telling her that she's the glue to the family. Right. That was yeah, one of my sure. favorite parts of that movie. <laughs> Mine too. Um, I'm kind of still old fashioned in that way. I mean, I look at, um, not trying to get too political here, but I mean, I look at the fact that we have a woman vice president right now there are other countries who are still not okay with that as far as like how America is. Um, so are we gonna lose their respect? I believe yes. Um, so I think that a man does have his place. I'm not saying that a woman can't go out and do and accomplish anything she wants to. I'm not saying that, but I think that um, well, when God made us, it was he made man and then he made woman for a companion for man. It wasn't to supersede him or, I mean, it was to stand by him, not in front or behind him, beside of him. And um, I believe that that's, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit old fashioned still, but <laughs> um, I think that this shows that a lot. It's not that her opinion didn't matter because it mattered to him, but she knew that he was to make the final decision because he was the man. I know you're not alone in that type of thinking either. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not, but like my parents are and stuff like that. Like they're very much of the belief of like, uh, like my dad is the one who has a final say type of thing. So you're not alone in that. Yeah, we still live in a very traditional area, right? If you were if you were taking this class at Harvard or something, right? You might. Yeah, it would probably meet people who think a lot differently. Right? A lot of people here are very sentimental or traditional in that way. Well, it's kind of like a sports thing where it's like just because the center is to, I'm going to be, if nobody knows sports, Lord help you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if uh, just because the center is six foot 10 and the point guard is five foot 10 doesn't mean that they're any less important. There's just different specializations for both of those roles. I, I and, agree. And, Sorry, you go on, Bill. No, you go, Nicole. Go ahead. I, I agree, but I think especially with our younger generations today, I think that we view leadership roles a lot differently, and I think that I don't think that, like, you know, the example you used, Crystal, the vice president, I don't think that would be seen as superseding men, per se, I think that that would be, mm. for me, honestly, it's kind of just more diversity and representation. And I think that like thinking back, especially to this area, if you think about Germany, for instance, 
if they would have had Jewish people in their government, do you think that anything like this would have happened? Or that if, you know, when slavery was prominent, if black people would have been in places of power like that, the, the, atro the atrocities that they were faced with would have been able to go forward. I don't think so. And I think that I think that women, even though we have been taking on a lot of different unique roles are still the glue of the family. And I think that it still takes a woman to make a home. But I think that, especially today, women and men are viewed on more of a level playing field as far as value goes. Or perhaps we're just seeing the value of the women that are in the world. Um, you know, I mean, people took for granted, um, uh, for years of what the woman's, um, successes were. Look, even in this movie, we look at Bogart as the, the ramrod or the, the force that drives this. But I think he, uh, Ingrid Bergman was an awesome, um, awesome actress. Um, she brought with her a caliber of actress that um, enabled this movie to be what it is. It would not be the same movie without her. So in, in looking at that, uh, the gender respect, um, I can't imagine watching this movie with, uh, without her. So to me, she's as important as maybe Mr. Uh, Bogart, uh, because she was one of the elite actresses of her day. So just look at it like that. We all have some value and uh, uh, she certainly did have that value in this field. Yeah, she's, she is, that's something we haven't talked about. She is great, right? She, she doesn't have to go and explain all of her emotions either, right? Just one look at Rick, right, that she gives is enough to show, right? A million emotions that she's feeling, right? So the movie is, again, masterful in that way. Neither Rick nor Ilsa have to, have to even articulate to show the emotions they're doing, they're feeling. And there's one uh, scene in particular where Ilsa is sitting in Rick's saloon or his his place of business and the camera and the lighting is so amazing it's half of her face is dark real dark the other side is light which gave me the indication of being in between and betwixt having to make a decision and with that look on her face it was amazing she didn't have to speak a word I uh, read in something that uh, you sent us uh, about she used very little makeup. Very that was her her history. She used very little makeup, but they put a a filter somehow in the camera. I can't remember how that all came to play, but to tone her down to didn't show any blemishes if she had any uh, or anything. So. The camera was really, and the lighting and the 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 technician was showing the scene uh, through something other than maybe a a vocal part. Yeah, what you what you're bringing up with the lighting, one side of the face is shadow and one's light. This is going to become part of a genre that we're getting ready to to talk about, which is film noir. Casablanca is often called a noir. I think it's much more than that. That's why I put it in the drama category. But like noir is all about like, you know, people who are conflicted, the darkness within them versus the light. And oftentimes you'll see, especially in these black and white films, the, the, the difference, the contrasts between the dark and the light. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up, Bill. But this is a good time to talk about some film. We haven't, we've talked themes we haven't talked film much today um did you all really quick did you all notice when uh richard was or yeah richard when he was putting those uh passports in the safe the use of his silhouette in that shot yeah. i know there was some importance to that but i really could not connect it with anything 
but it, it just stuck with me. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that, that scene. Um. When they were in, um, him and Sam were inside the cafe after they had ran everyone out. The first time that she had came in um, and left, he just knew she was coming back and he was drinking. And, you know, he had some light on him, but you could see like kind of through the door as the traffic was going by and how busy and um, kind of charging that the outside was while he was just remaining calm because he just knew that she was going to come back. I thought that was very significant in that exact moment and what he was feeling. This is a good, the lighting tricks that we're talking about, this is a good time to talk about black and white filmmaking, right? We have, we've, we've done three black and white movies in a row, but we haven't really talked about black and white so too much, right? Maybe, I'll be curious to know what your guys' thoughts on this. Um, um, before, before this class started, maybe some of you who haven't spoken up yet can say something too. Before this class started, did you, were you comfortable watching black and white or were or some of you the type like, oh, black and white, it's always better than color, right? Some of, what are some, what were some of your guys' attitudes about black and white like before the class? And maybe how has the class maybe changed your mind or added to it? Well, I have me. never been one for, sorry. Go ahead, Ron, go ahead. I have never been one for, uh, black and white movies i prefer them to be in color i still don't really prefer black and white movies though casablanca what kind of changed my mind a little bit because out of the movies we've watched so far casablanca was definitely my favorite one all right so someone else is going to say something before before ryan i was going to say um this is I've really watched older movies, but I'm glad I joined this class because I like these movies. I don't, I've liked all the movies I've watched. Right. Uh, before this class, I really, I'd seen some black and white movies, westerns that my family had been watching, but I'd never been super interested in them. And really, my perspective has changed a lot. I feel like, especially with modern cinema, a lot of times we are just blasted with color, blasted with scenery, with all these beautiful images. And sometimes in certain films, I feel like that can get in the way of the film. And I feel like taking that color away from the black and white film leaves us a lot more to appreciate in a way. I agree. I think that um, it was very significant for its time I think that um, it gives so much more dynamic to the film, uh, to the emotion of what's going on. Because, yeah, we have lighting in, in colored movies, but in those black and whites, you can really like feel the emotion. You're not just seeing it, you can actually feel it. It's a little different. Um, I like both color and black and white, depends on what it is. But I believe that definitely there's a lot of significance in that. And it shows maybe more feeling at times than what a color does. Yeah, the stuff you guys are talking about with the, with the light and the darkness and stuff. That's only something black and white can do. Right? You can do it a bit in color, but like it's a trick and only black and white. You can only really throw, put a pull off in, in it, I think. To me, it feels like there's so much depth to explore. It leaves us room to really explore the depth of the film itself and of the content rather than just the imagery. Do you guys think that black and white, This I actually watched the video on this last night when I was preparing for this class. Do you guys think black and white, um, do, you feel, does you, do you feel like what you're watching is real when you're watching black and white or does it feel outside of time and space you, got, you know what i'm asking like does it feel uncannily weird or do you feel like so 
because this is a question that's asked. Some people say black and white gives a more of a documentary type feel, right? especially in like talking about the forties or something, right? If you're talking, if you're filming in black and white, puts us in that time, right? Some people say black and white um, takes us outside of reality. It makes movies seem more fiction than, than uh, real. What's your guys take on this question? It definitely I'm just the opposite. I believe that um, for me, uh, black and white makes it more real to me. Um, uh, one of the reasons is there used to be an old saying that says, um, you can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> well, we know the forest is made up of trees. Mm -hmm. And, but yet sometimes we may not see as much of the meaning of the movie or maybe the art of the producers and directors and even the actors, actresses, uh, when there's so much color. Uh, I forget who said that we, uh, one, of, one of our students, maybe it was Regan, said that we're bombarded practically with so much color. Might've been Nicole, I, I can't remember, but I find that to be true sometimes. Uh, my, if I'm to look back and I know that you know, my, my age and everyone else's is different. We're going to look at things in a little bit different perspective. But my five greatest movies, probably three of those are black and white. And I can't imagine watching 12 Angry Men in color. So to me, uh, just to me, um, I love the black and white, but I also love the color. For me, if it's in black and white, it gives me more of like, a, okay, this is important. You need to pay attention type of feel. Like, uh, we're going to watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I'm not going to be paying, I know I should, but I'm not going to be paying nearly as much attention to different little subtle things in the camera as much as I was for Casablanca, uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath, and Citizen Kane. And it's specifically for that reason. Right. Although the only two movies that I've ever watched before this class that were in black and white were four classes, and one was a streetcar named Desire, and one was uh, The Grapes of Wrath in high school. I think that it also black and white leaves more for you to decide upon yourself, whereas color kind of. This is how it is. This is how we've laid it out. And this is how we want you to interpret it. I think black and white kind of leaves that open for you to make that decision on your own of which way that you want to go or which way that you feel about each situation and maybe even the movie as a whole. Now, this is this movie is an interesting case because this is one of those ones that Ted Turner colorized for the Turner Classics Movies channel. So uh, if you ever want an interesting experiment, watch it in the collar and then compare it to the black and white and see, see which one you prefer. Um, yeah, the collar, the collar has always existed in film. Um, that's, a, that's a misconception a lot of people have. Collar has always existed in film. Even in like the 1910s, 1920s and the really early infant films, lots of times they would put a, a collar filter over the black and white or they would collar something in. Um, so, and black collar was definitely prominent before the movies we've watched. Uh, Gone with the Wind was made in 1938, right? And it has tons of collar. Uh, for those of you who've seen, might have seen Gone with the Wind. So, uh, it's a, even then, in this time of Hollywood, it was a choice whether they could do black and white or collar. Collar costed more, but uh, even then, it was a choice. Um, really quick, Crystal, I agree with you so much. I think that, you know, when, especially back then, when they chose to do a film in black and white, there were a lot of choices that they omitted because, you know, a lot of communication is done with, you know, imagery, with colors. And some things they might not have been able to communicate with that. They had to find other ways to reach us. And another thing for me personally with black and white films, I find them very nostalgic. I wouldn't say they don't feel unreal or kind of separated like that. I will say that the acting in that era was very, very different than it was today. And then we see a lot of farce 
And sometimes that can pull me out of it a little bit. But with Casablanca, I was just enthralled. I thought it was wonderful. Casablanca is, to me, it's the uh, it's the epitome of classic black and white movie. It just really is, and every every bit of it, the acting, the score, all of it, it's just it perfectly. If this is a word, encapsulates the uh, the feeling of watching a black and white movie. And I feel like watching it in color, to go back to your point a few minutes ago, watching it in color would just, it would take it away. Like it would take away the power of watching Casablanca. It's a, it's very interesting that you guys are so forward thinking about black and white and you know how it can be used as a tool, as an effective tool storytelling some people were so adamant like i will never watch anything in black and white right you guys probably know people who are like that right so i've never understood it but that was like that in high school <laughs> only reason why i watched grapes of wrath was because i had to right. other than that i was like eh, if it's in black and white i'm good but you know you get older and you learn like there's stuff to appreciate and everything I think that's that's it. There's 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 room to appreciate both. Uh, now, when we begin to watch some color films, uh, we may head back that direction too. Uh, but uh, I think that they, I, I think there's some movies that I, you know, would be hard to watch in black and white. Uh, but you know, the movies that we watch today are designed to be in color as opposed to the movies of yesteryear were black and white and they were doing things with cameras and lighting and things that were very important to the success of the film. So I think as we go along and we get a talk about these things, perhaps our minds will change back to, or mine may change back to, uh, I like color better in black and white. Uh, so we'll see. One thing I was going to add, I feel like in today's media, I re honestly really feel there is room for a comeback for black and white. I feel like today they could do some really, really interesting things with it. And I think it would be very interesting to watch a film done specifically for black and white today. There's a movie, it's a really artsy movie. So it's, there's a good chance not a lot of people's heard of it. And I've only ever heard of it. I haven't watched it. But if you remember that movie that came out a few years ago, The Witch, it takes place in like the 1600s. That was that director's first debut, or that was their debut. Their second movie was filmed in black and white on old film, just like it would be in the 40s. And it's supposed to be really good. And they use the the darkness and the light and all that really good oh, that's a that's a terrific movie it's called the lighthouse yes it is yes it is yeah it has um the twi what's his name robert pattinson and uh william defoe in it both of them are great performances i would recommend that movie mad max the newest mad max movie also was filmed in both color and black and white if you're Mad Max Fury Road. So if, you, if you're interested in another experiment and a comparison, I would recommend that one to everyone as well. I'm sure some of you have seen the Mad Max Fury Road, probably in color. There is a black and white cut. So good, good discussion today, guys. And again, a very energizing discussion. Um, come out of this class every day feeling good. This, we were having some great conversations. So uh, we're gonna, for, for Thursday, we're watching my favorite movie of all time. I love One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> you know, so, so many iconic performances in this movie. So many actors you'll see. This movie's got Jack Nicholson. It's got Danny DeVito. It's got Christopher Lloyd. 
right? Louise Fletcher, tons of Hollywood icons who even just got their start in this movie. Um, Brad Dorif, who plays Chucky, the Chucky voice, right? He's in this. Um, you'll see so many faces from movies you've seen in this. It's an, it's an iconic piece of cinema. And this is a movie where I will say that the movie is better than the book. Anybody who says otherwise is wrong. Okay. <laughs> right, so that's the ball. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you, Dr. Yeager, on this class. I absolutely love it. Like, I was thinking, okay, I've got to have this appreciation class before I get my degree. And um, I didn't care a thing about art. So <laughs> I didn't want to do art. And then, you know, I was like, okay, film. I love movies and I love TV. So I never imagined that this class was going to be like it is. And the discussions that we all have, dad and I go away excited every Tuesday and Thursday. We're like, man, class was great. We didn't want it to end because <laughs> I just love hearing what everybody else says. And it opens my eyes and my mind into other perspectives and points of view. And I am enjoying this class more than I ever dreamed that I would. And we never watch anything the same. We can watch anything from a TV show to a commercial and we're sitting there pointing stuff out. Well, look at the lighting there. Well, look at what they done right here. <laughs> and mom's like, is that because of your old class? <laughs> but um, we, we're really enjoying it. And I hope that everyone else is enjoying it as much as I am. Cause I look forward to it every, every single Tuesday and Thursday. So thanks to this class, because I think we've got a great class that gives a lot of opinion and, and good feedback. Don't yeah, take this. I, I'd like go ahead. Go ahead, Nicole. I was gonna say, don't take this the wrong way, Dr. Yeager, but this is the highlight of my Tuesday and Thursdays. <laughs> I know a lot of other classes, it's difficult to get participation sometimes, but with this one, I always love the conversation, the discussion. It honestly makes it feel like we're not, you know, even though we're on computers, it makes it feel like we're past COVID in a way. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I want to say that I I have a tendency to talk too much and I really try to hold it back. But I love everyone's comments. Absolutely everyone's comments. And Corey, we have to talk some sports because um, I'm a sports fanatic and got a lot of de debating questions for you as time would go on. But thank you, Dr. Yeager, for the way you handle this. And I know we're only a couple of weeks into it, but I just love the class also. So thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. For a very enjoyable experience. Classes like this are why I do what I do. So I wouldn't do anything else. So it's definitely enjoyable. Corey, I think the same thing. And I really, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Reagan. <laughs> I really like hearing everybody's opinions on the movie because we're all seeing the same thing and, and we come out sometimes with different conclusions. And, that, and I feel like everybody here is well educated so they can really get into it, get in deep. <laughs> so I like to listen a lot. I was going to say, Corey, we also have to talk sports. Uh, my brother says he knows you. My brother's name is Matt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says you're a big Reds fan. He is, or I am. I am. I'm a big Reds fan. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know you and Matt were brothers. Yep. Ten years apart. Hmm. I heard that. I can I can tell now. Like I can see it. Like I can see <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we'll call it a day on that. So like I said, I'm jealous of some of you who might have never seen this movie coming up for watching it for the very first time. It's one of the, it's, right. one, it's one of these movies that will change you. I, <laughs> it did me. So I will look forward to Thursday very much. If you guys are ever on the Boone campus, come and see me. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. See you guys. Bye.